All right, well, let's stand and take our Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4. I know that, you know, after a big day and a long day, uh, you know, it's, it's always a little tempting to have a little sermonette, a little devotion, and maybe every once in a while the Lord will lead me that way. He didn't lead me that way, and we're just going to preach the word, and we're going to have church tonight. And uh, 1 Kings chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 29. The Bible says this, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much. Now I want you to notice this phrase. This phrase jumped out at me. And largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men. Then Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 Proverbs. Just to get a context, there's about 582 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. So that's only like one-third of all the Proverbs that he spoke. He spake 3,000, or not more than that. He spake 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. I want to preach with the Lord's help on this subject. And I hope it will be, be a help and maybe, maybe what you need or what we need in this hour. I want to preach on this subject. Largeness of heart. Largeness of heart. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. I pray that you'd speak to us. And, and Lord, it, there's this joy about a night like tonight. It's such a blessing when prayer and doors have been knocked. And, and hearing people say that they came from a card on their door. They were invited by someone. In. And Lord, to, just, to also just enjoy in the service that we had this morning. And, and it's just always a special time. But Father, I know you want to speak to us tonight, and, and maybe even, Lord, as kind of an amendum or as an appendices or an addition, Lord, to what you did this morning, and, and maybe in preparation of, of the road that I pray that you have us on towards the second miracle. Uh, bless the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The Bible in verse 29, speaking about Solomon, okay, I'm going to just stop. I want to just ask, let's see, uh, can all of you, Brother Donald, can you hear me good and crisp back there? Everyone can hear me good and solid? All right, good. All right, just want to make sure you can hear me all right. In verse 29, the Bible speaks to what God did for Solomon. It speaks about the fact that God gave him largeness. The word largeness speaks about an expansion, an extension of breath. That God literally worked in him and expanded. He extended the breath of something in his life. The Bible tells us what he made large or what he enlarged. He enlarged his heart. Now specifically in this passage, heart can refer to many things. But it's similar uh, to what Solomon requested uh, in, in earlier uh, here in 1 Kings. And also in Exodus where the Bible talked about those who were wise hearted as they were able to make the, the, the different articles for the tabernacle, the word heart could be used as this, as capacity or as skill or as acumen. So the idea is that God increased his acumen. God increased his skill. God increased his capacity. And someone might say, well, in what area did God increase his capacity? Well, it tells us in wisdom and in understanding. And so here is Solomon at whatever his capacity was, at whatever limits that he had for wisdom and understanding, the ability to listen, the ability to observe and discern and to determine what is right from wrong, to determine how best to go about achieving objectives, the ability to teach and instruct, whatever his, whatever his heart was in that area, God put his hand on it and God enlarged it. God expanded it. God literally increased his capacity 
for wisdom. And I want you to see to the extent that his heart was expanded. The Bible says this, even as the sand that is on the seashore. God expanded, God extended the breadth of his wisdom, the breadth of his understanding. How much so? As the sand is of the seashore. What is the word of God telling you? Is it really literally saying that as the, the actual amounts of grain of sand? No, the idea is this, is that they couldn't count the amount of grains of sand. That, that it was a limitless number. In other words, God increased, God expanded Solomon's acumen for wisdom and understanding to an extent where whenever he went to draw for wisdom, he never ran out. Whenever he went to the drawer for observations or for judgments or for decisions or for teaching, he never reached a height. He never reached a limit. He never came to a place where he could say, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to say here. I don't have a good answer for this. Because every time he went to get it, guess what? It was there because God increased his heart to a limitless capacity of wisdom. That's an amazing thing to think about. To think about that, that, listen, in verse 31, the Bible tells us that God had given wisdom to many others. He had given wisdom to men such as Ethan and Heman and Calcol. But Solomon had increased them because while all of those men had wisdom of God, all of them had limits. All of them had lids. But when you sat before Solomon with an issue, when you sat before Solomon or stood before him and brought a case... He had a limitless ability to discern, to instruct, to teach, and there was never any end to the breadth of his understanding. You know, you think about this, if you, if you look at preachers or even authors and even people that write in specific genres, you will find that they have an extent, that they have a boundary. In other words, after an author usually writes one or two books, Everything that follows that is usually like his first two books. They usually can only go so, they only can write so much, they only have so much insight. When you even think about preachers, oftentimes, and you can often summarize preachers into a couple different things that they emphasize, a couple different things that they're strong suited at. Why? Because we are all limited in the amount of wisdom and the amount of knowledge and the amount of expertise that we have. But Solomon could have wrote. He could have wrote as much as he wanted and never exhausted the amount of wisdom that God gave him. That's profound to think about. How was, his, how was this limitless supply of wisdom unearthed? Well, first of all, obviously in his answers and in his judgments. People would come, and they would come with questions, they would come with problems, they would come with court cases, and he could, he could listen, he could observe, and he could, give the right, he could give the right judgment, he could give the right sentence, he could give the right answer. He would have captains and generals and architects and, and all of these leaders coming to him, and he could listen to them, and he could give them the proper answer and the proper direction and exactly what they would need to do. So in answers and judgments, but get this, his wisdom was limitless in expressions, because the picture is, he, he didn't just keep his wisdom confined to the throne. The Bible says this, that he had so much wisdom pouring out that he was even expressing it in thousands of Proverbs. He would, he would, he would be able to articulate these observations of the human experience and the patterns of human behavior and the error and, and the ways of God. And he would be able in brief, pithy little sentences to be able to teach things that you and I could literally spend hundreds of pages trying to say the way he said it. And he didn't just, he didn't just say, you know, you know, people might be lucky to have or blessed to have one or two good quotes or one or good two good statements. You know, most authors and, and most people might have one or two good things that you pull from. No, he had 3,000 proverbs and all of them were good. He was dropping the mic all day long. But if that wasn't enough, he was giving expressions in songs and poems. The Song of Solomon, obviously, and others. So he was writing poetry and songs and these beautiful expressions of love and beautiful expressions of the way of God and how the working of God came. And he would interweave the birds and the trees and the hyssops that would grow out of the walls or, or the tree, and the different trees and the different fowl. And he could observe animals, animals in creation. He could draw them in and he could give lessons and he could give instructions. And essentially... 
Every time he had something to say, God had empowered him to have something powerful and wise to say. That's an amazing thing. You and I can't even comprehend that. No limit. How often do you and I come to a problem and we, we I don't know about that one. You know, there's, all of us, we feel good here, we feel good there. But inevitably in life, you and I come to situations where we're like, okay, I've never seen that before. I'm not exactly sure what I think about that. I'm going to have to go home and chew on that and pray about that. Solomon didn't have days like that. Not because of Solomon, but because God touched him in such a divine, miraculous way. God increased Solomon's capacity as a king beyond any beyond the capacity that any king would ever know outside of Jesus Christ. He touched him tangibly in a way that in Solomon's daily activity, you could see the hand of God all over him. You know, I couldn't help but as I was reading that and thinking about that, I couldn't help but think about what James said in James 1.5. He, he says this, if any of you lack wisdom... Any of you lack wisdom? We've all been there. Well, I'm sorry. That's not what it says. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. You know, a lot of times as you and I, as parents, as couples, uh, uh, as families, as workers, rising into positions in the ministry, in dealing with spiritual issues, maybe with friends and trying to help people and navigate people. All of us have times where our heart feels too small. Come on now. If you don't ever feel that way, you're very deceived. And we'll get to that point in a little bit. All of us have times in life where our capacity feels too small. We seem to lack the wisdom. We seem to lack how to navigate or what to do or how to handle this situation. We feel like we don't have the capacity for this position or this calling or for this situation that we're in. And oftentimes what we think is, man, uh, we just need to get someone else or someone else needs to do this. And here is a reality. God doesn't need to get anyone else. God just needs to give you a bigger heart. And God says this, that if you and I will go to him and say, God, God, I, I feel like I need wisdom in this. You, you have put me in this place. You have put me in this position. You have put us in these circumstances. God, would you, would you enlarge in our heart? You know what's an amazing thing? God said this, I'll do it for you. I will do it for you liberally. You know... <laughs> When you run out of ideas, God always has more. See, you and I, we get into situations and, 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 and we hit dead ends and we hit walls and we think, well, that's the end of that. I don't know. I've tried everything. I don't know what else to do. I don't know how else to talk to this person. I don't know how else to deal with this person. I don't know what else I can do in this situation. You know what's amazing? That God always has more answers. God always has more wisdom. That if you and I will seek the Lord, he can give us ideas that he can help us tap into ideas that we didn't even know existed. The answer for you and me isn't to quit the role, it's to let God enlarge our heart for it. You know, some, some of you right now, you know, you know God, God may be bringing you into something here soon. You know, I'm thinking about our church and, and I'm thinking about the second miracle and I'm thinking about where we're going. I'm just going to tell you, if for, I, I believe with all, my, with all my heart that God wants to use the people sitting right here in this auditorium to achieve the things that God has. You know what that means? That many of you are going to be asked to step into some roles you've never done before. Some roles that may make you a little scared, a little uncomfortable. And you may think, well, I can't do this, or I'm not for this role, or someone else. But the answer isn't to deny the role, or reject the role, or quit the role. The answer is this. God, if you're calling me to this, I need you to enlarge my heart so that I can do this role. You know, sometimes you may feel as a dad, you may feel as a husband, you may feel as a mom. You may feel like, I, I'm not doing a good job. I have no idea what I'm doing. And let me just stop and say, most often, parents, you're doing a lot better than you know you are. We just tend to be hard on ourselves. But understand this, the idea isn't to quit. The idea is to let God increase your capacity so that he can help you do better and to do more. Well, why do we often lack heart? Well, we often lack heart because we lack prayer. 
You see, Solomon didn't wake up one day and God just, boom, enlarged his heart. It started off with God coming to him in a vision and saying, what would you have? What would you desire? You know what Solomon said? Solomon said, would you give me more wisdom? Would you give me understanding? I I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to come in and go out. I don't know how to shepherd these people. And God said, because you have asked for this, I will give this unto you. And sometimes the reason why you and I might be falling short, the reason why you and I might not have the direction and the wisdom is because we never really take the time. We talk about it. And we say, oh, man, I wish God would help me. But we never take the time to actually get on our knees before God and say, God, would you give me wisdom in this area? I would also say this. The, sands at the, the sand is found in the scripture. See, Solomon, Solomon was pulling, the Bible says, he had so much wisdom. It was like the sand of the seashore. It was this limitless amount. And I just want to remind you, there's a lot of wisdom in this word. There's a lot of, there's a lot of truth. There's a lot of insight. There's a lot of things that God has for us. And a lot of times, we don't think we have the answer. We don't think we know the answer. But sometimes we just need to look at this. There's a lot of sand in here. There's a lot of wisdom in here. There's a lot of truth in here. If we would just search the scriptures and let the Holy Ghost instruct us, there is a lot of insight for us in our life. And so here is Solomon, and God has increased, God has expanded, God has enlarged his capacity to to do the things that God has called him to do. And, And you know, this isn't, Solomon's not the first person, and the Israelites aren't the only people that have ever had wisdom either. Notice what it says in verse 30. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children, notice this, of the east country, and all of the wisdom of Egypt. You know, there were other people that were considered wise outside of Israel. There were people to the east in Babylon, Mesopotamia. There were people in the south in the kingdom of Egypt. And the people of Egypt that were considered wise. They were considered brilliant. There were scholars. There were generals. There were kings. There were leaders who had experience and made observations and had written Proverbs. There, had been, there are many sayings that have been accumulated from Egypt and from Babylon and from Mesopotamia. There, there are many people in the Eastern culture and in the place of Egypt that were seen as wise. They were seen, they were seen as being great. But I love what the Word of God says in verse 30. It says, His wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East country and all the wisdom of Egypt. But here's what I want you to know, that when God touched Solomon, Solomon was different than anyone outside of God's plan. Solomon's wisdom was different and greater than all the wisdom of the world. I think that would be easy to understand. Solomon's, Solomon's saying would have been spiritual. You know, I, I actually did this. You go and you read some of the sayings and some of the proverbs of, of you know, ancient, you know, the ancient East, and you read them, and you know what you're going to find? That, that, that the focus of them is individual. That when they would reference God's or, or divinity, there was never any, like, real solid truth behind it. It was more like a saying or an expression. In other words, the wisdom, the wisdom of the lost was completely isolated and disconnected from God. But you know what I love about Solomon's words? For as practical as Solomon's words are, for as, for as bottom shelf, in a sense, as Solomon's words are, for the fact that Solomon's words in Proverbs can be used with your money or can be used in, in, in different areas of your life, you know what's amazing about Solomon's words? They connected us to God. They connect you to the Lord. They speak about a God who rules and reigns. They speak about the fear of the Lord and how he rewards and how he judges. And, and as you read and as you hear the, the truths of Solomon, It's not just secular, it's not just carnal, it's not just worldly, but they are spiritual and they connect and bring you close to God. His sayings would have just been truer. You can parcel through the wise, you can parcel through even today, you can parcel through good quotes and sayings of people, and you know what you'll find? A good chunk of them aren't true. You might find a good one here and a good one there, and that's how the people of Egypt were. That's how the people of Mesopotamia were. You could go through and you could scan through, and you're like, yeah, that's, that's off. That's weird. That is, that's, that's kind of odd. But as you begin to make your way through, you might find a good nugget here or a good truth there. But you know what, you know what is amazing about Solomon? Every single proverb he gave was true and right. And you know when you hear truth, something resonates in you that says that's right. That's true. So as he spoke, people would see there's a difference between him. 
There is, there's a spirituality to his words. Everything he says is true. Also, he was selfless in his wisdom. You look at the world around us, and especially in the Old Testament time, do you know if anybody had anything special, do you know what they used it for? To benefit themselves. If you were a king and you had wisdom and you had the ability to organize, you know what you'd basically do? You would basically use the people to make yourself a big deal. But what I love about Solomon is Solomon was selfless and Solomon was teaching and Solomon was imparting and Solomon was bringing justice and judgment. He wasn't using things to make everything good for him, but he was benefiting others and benefiting the kingdom. And as Solomon was being gifted of God, the people of God flourished and celebrated and enjoyed the blessings of God. And ultimately, his results were greater. The kingdom under Solomon had the greatest unity, the greatest judgments, the greatest peace, and had been built on a higher scale than at any other time. And no other nation could come close to the things that God used Solomon to do. As I thought about Solomon and I thought about all those of the world, I couldn't help but think this. There's a difference between when, God, when man makes their heart large and when God makes a heart large. What do you mean? I mean, look, all of us as human beings, we have the ability to increase our capacity. We can read and we can study and we can roll up our sleeves and we can, we can try to be successful and we can try to increase and we can do it all without God. Now, I understand he gives you breath. I understand he allows you to breathe. But I'm saying this without submission to him, without relying on him, we can do it. We call it this, doing it in the flesh, where you and I are doing our own power and our own strength. And there's a lot of people that want to do more. They want to have a big heart, and they want, to, they want to conquer this and do this. But they never seek God. They never go to God. It is a man-made thing. It is a man, it is a man-increased enterprise and when you have something that has been enlarged by man, it looks totally different than when it's been enlarged by God. When somebody has been touched by God, here's what you'll feel. You'll feel closer to Christ when you're around them. There'll be spirituality. No, no, no. It won't just be, it won't just be everything is carnal and everything can be explained. When you talk to a, a believer who's been touched by God, who has been enlarged by God, and you ask, how did you do this, or how was this accomplished? They're not going to just give you the bullet points and all, all of the practical and all the secular. They're going to start off with talking about God. They're going to start off by talking about his power. They're going to talk off by, by talking about his spirit. They're going to start off by talking about Jesus Christ. And it's not just going to be like, okay, now I got that out of the way. Now let me tell you how I really did it. It's going to be a sincere conviction that God did that in their life. You know, you can be successful without being spiritual. There's a lot of people that roll up their sleeves and they enlarge themselves and they try to increase themselves and increase their knowledge and they try to do all of it without God. And here's the thing, there's no spirituality attached to it at all. But understand this, you will be much more fulfilled with the person you become if God enlarges you. And you can have all the success and you can rise to the top. But when you look in the mirror and you know that you were carnal or you know that you were secular or you know that you was all individual in your strength, you won't be very satisfied or very content with who you are. But when you know God touched you and God empowered you and God conformed you into his image, there will be a great fulfillment in knowing that it was of the Lord. I'd say it this way, and I think this is important for us as a church to always remember Ministries enlarged by flesh will always feel fleshly. It's hard, to art, it's hard to articulate this, but you know it when you're around it. You know it when you're around it. I remember in the early years, just, uh, you know, when I, was a, when I was a church planner, even in San Marcos, and I would go to, you know, different churches, large churches, and just observe go look at their property and look at their buildings and just kind of look at things and, and get ideas for just different things. And every once in a while, I'd meet up with a youth guy or I'd meet up with an assistant. And I would always, I would always want to hear, you know, kind of how things happen. And, you know, sometimes there would be people that you knew that they had been touched by God. And, and they, were, they were talking the scripture and they were talking about the Lord. And then there's other times where you just tell it was all flesh. We did this and we did that and and there is just a, there is just, it just doesn't feel the same. No, no, we don't want our church to feel like a corporation. We want our church to feel like a church that's been touched by the hand of God. 
And you don't want to have a ministry and you don't want to have something that you just did in your own strength using your own tactics with politics. No, we don't want to be a political church. We don't want to be a church that has to, you know, smooge people or find out who the givers are and make them feel really good. No, we just want to serve God and do things God's way and let God build his church. There was a difference between Solomon and the wisdom of the world. And then there's one other thing I want you to know. It's verse 34. And it says, and there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings, from all kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. And this makes sense. When someone is really good at something and there's a lot of success, you know what everyone else does? They go to see it so they can copy it, right? Somebody sells, somebody sells a good product, you know, uh, somebody makes something really well, somebody, you know, begins to go about, a, you know, some kind of delivery or different things. Inevitably, other people are going to see that pattern and they're going to go and they're going to learn and they're going to take it to their business or they're going to take it to what they do and they're going to duplicate it. They're going to replicate it. You, you know what happens? Here's this king. He's building this kingdom. And, and it's expanding, and there's workers, and there's food, and there's peace, and he's, he's giving wisdom, and he's making good decisions, and this thing is just moving with divine power, and words getting around. And other nations are hearing. I mean, first of all, you have all the nations around that they're bringing tribute. They're paying taxes because they're, they understand that Israel has now increased them. The Philistines understand that the Israelites have gotten larger than them. The, the people of the north, the people of the south, they all realize that Israel has expanded. You notice that kings begin to do? They want to see this. They want to know what's going on. They want to learn. They want to observe. They want to see what they can bring back to their own kingdom so that they can operate like Solomon operates. Solomon, no, Solomon's wisdom was so plain that other people came around to listen and affirmed the wisdom that he had. You know, I thought about this, just knowing how leadership is and knowing how humans are. I wonder how many other kings around the globe thought they were just as wise as Solomon. I'm just as smart as him. You see my Proverbs? No, I just know that I know how human beings are. People start talking about Solomon. Some other king is like, well, yeah, you know, he just got a lucky break here and there. But you know what? We're operating just as good as them. And you know, how many, how many people around, around the various kingdoms thought in their heart that they were just as wise as Solomon? But you know the difference was? Nobody was going to hear them. Nobody was going to learn from them. Nobody was affirming anything that they were doing. You know what? They were just self-deceived, thinking that they have something that God hasn't really given them. Solomon's wisdom wasn't made by man, but it was affirmed by man. Why are you saying that? Here's why. Because one of the greatest dangers in life is to deceive ourselves into thinking we have a large heart when we don't. No, no, listen. We live, we live in a world and with a flesh of pride. And we tend to, we tend to inflate or have an inflated view of ourselves often. And one of the greatest dangers that we can make is that we think we are wise. We think we are operating at a high capacity but in all reality, we're not. You know, people that are self-deceived usually have a small crowd. What do you mean by a small crowd? Here's what I mean. They have one or two people that affirm them in all their wisdom. But at their job, they can't get along with anyone. And in their family, they have all kinds of unrest and they have all kinds of problems. And they're at church and they can't seem to get up. But and you talk to them, oh, no, I'm very wise. Everybody else around me has got a great problem. Everyone else around me has a problem. And people that are self-deceived have one or two people that will agree with them, but they don't, take a, they don't look around life and realize, man, I got conflicts here, and I got conflicts here, and I have problems here. And my, parent, my, my children don't seem to think I'm wise. My spouse doesn't seem to think I'm wise. Or maybe my spouse thinks I'm wise, but, man, I, everything's going bad at my, at my work. I can't seem to keep a job. I can't seem to keep relationships well. I'm having issues in this ministry. I've, got, I've been to 300 different churches because no church is good enough. I'm just saying this, that a lot of times we can be self-deceived and self, one of the evidences of being self-deceived is this. You, only have, you have a couple people that are echoing you, but in all reality around you, there's not a lot of people declaring or affirming that you're exercising wisdom. 
if, there, if you are exercising wisdom, there will be affirmation. You will see you will see that there will be harmony over here. You will see that you will be able to work in this environment. It doesn't mean that there aren't some people here and there that you're not going to have a problem with. It doesn't mean that you might get a bad boss who targets you because you're a Christian or because they're feeling a competitive uh, issue with you that you might supersede them. That can happen. But overall, you should be able to look at life and your engagements and your, rea- and your relationships and look at how you handle finances and how you work and different areas of your life. And you should, listen, if you have wisdom, there will be affirmation from people in that. Here's what that means. You need to look for patterns to discover your place, with, discover your capacity. Why am I saying this? Here's why I'm saying this. Because... You could know your Bible, could love the Lord, but you could lack wisdom in certain areas of your life and blame everybody else for the problems and never just stop and take the time to look at yourself and say, am I the problem? Amen. If you find yourself falling into successive problems or patterns, it might not be that everybody else is the problem. No, if, and we don't have a lot of this here, but, but, but just keep this in mind. You talk to someone, they've been to like 35 churches, and they're telling you how there's no good churches in America. That might, that might not exactly be the problem. Come on. You can't, you can't seem to have one boss. You can't seem to have one good manager. You can't seem to get along with anybody. You, you, the only way you can do ministry is if you're by yourself. Just give me a ministry and let me do it. No, no. you need to understand and see patterns in your life so that you can ask God to help you grow in your capacity so that you can move forward in your life. Look for repeated failure. Look where, is there a pattern of, you know, you're put in this position and this position and I, I keep running into the same issues. So that you can increase your capacity. Let God show you where you're off so he can help you get right. So that you can do better in life. Here is Solomon. And God has touched him. And God has enlarged his heart. And increased his wisdom. And is the sand of the seashore. He is being used in a mighty way. And his wisdom is excelling the world. And his wisdom is being affirmed by others. And, and what the word of God wants you and me to get. Is not that you and I can be Solomon. Matter of fact I really wanted to preach on this. And I may still get to this. The only person that's, that's ever, that's, that can be compared to Solomon is Jesus Christ. Who exceeded Solomon. But what we can glean from it is this, is that when you have run out of ideas, God always has more. I want to ask you a question tonight. Is there an area where you need God to give you a larger heart? Is there an area in your life where you need God to extend, expand the breadth of your capacity? And one of the things I've I've, I've enjoyed about this whole thing Thing that we've experienced with moving and going. You know what I've seen? I've seen God put people in our church in positions they weren't, they don't know anything about. They're not really, they weren't really trained for, they weren't really suited for. You know what God did? God enlarged their heart to help them do things that were way above their, their range of knowledge in those areas. And here's the question I have for you tonight. Is there an area where God needs to enlarge in your heart? Expand your capacity take you to the next level in some things. And when, listen, and when something comes to you that feels like this is too much, this is too much, I can't reach this, before you deny it, before you reject it, maybe consider this, that God doesn't want to pass it off to someone else. God wants to enlarge in your heart to do what maybe he's calling you to do. You know, Pastor, I've, I've tried it all. I I feel like I can't do, I've run out of wisdom, I've run out of ideas. Well, the, the, the simple truth tonight is this, that when you have run out of ideas, God always has more. May God give us largeness of heart. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, I know that all of us have different times and, 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 and different things in our life, God, where we feel, we feel small, we feel like the, the, the knowledge base or the, the, the ability to know what to do, the decision making, the, even maybe the very skill of something. 
feels above us. But yet you've called us to it. You've put it into us. God, would you help us to seek you? Would you help us to see you enlarge in our heart so that we could be used? I pray you'd bless this invitation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet tonight, the invitation is open. Maybe the Lord has enlarged you already and he's given you something. He's helped you and you just want to praise him for it. Maybe there's something specifically in your heart you want to ask the Lord for. However the Lord has spoken, with every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet, the invitation is open.